I've done a few teaching on baptism, and to say that it's not important in, in our Christian walk is wrong. It's the foundation is not laid right. You can't build on top of a very high. And I found a lot of people's foundations are not are built on the, on the things that they're supposed to be that Paul talked about. But I want to talk about, about found, baptism, a foundational stone. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom, please, sir. You're the creator of all things. Heaven and earth, dogs, cats, horses, cows, dirt, sky, trees. You made everything in Christ Jesus for him and from him. There's nothing that was made that wasn't made through him and by him. So please let us give us that wisdom to, to see that in Jesus' name I ask. Baptism. I'm going to read from a couple of scriptures. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Just the first four verses. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. What shall we say then? So we continue in sin, that grace may abound more? God forbid. How shall we that are, other who have died in sin, still live in it? We're not supposed to live in it. Know you not that so many of you were baptized into Christ? Into Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we might walk in the newness of life. Huh. Now it's obvious from this passage as we listen to it that baptism has to do with something with sin. It has something to do with a man who professes to be a Christian going on in sin. There is something that quite wrong if he continues on in sin. It's wrong. It says it right here. Paul's shocked to find out that there are Christians to our suggestion that because we're saved by the goodness and the grace of God that we can uh, go on as living in sin. It doesn't have anything to do with our behavior. Really? If they act like it, uh, we can simply point to that time and uh, we said, I'll take Jesus, and I'll leave me baptized. That's right. But then I'm going to go do what I'm going to do, and do what I like. Paul said, that's not, uh, that's not the gospel, and that's not right, and you didn't understand your baptism too well, did you? If that's the attitude you have, the attitude you've got about this deal, I want to say it very bluntly to you. Christians are people who are noted for not sinning. That's what Christians are noted for. And if you sin, the world's going to tell you, you're not a Christian. That Christians aren't supposed to sin. And then they go around, well, everybody sins, and they talk about themselves, but there are a lot of those bumper stickers that you see on cars that are wearing. What is it? I don't, I don't like most of the stickers that have on cars. I don't like it anyway. None of it. They don't do it so much anymore. There are once in a while you see one that's kind of worthy, but not you know, on the internet, just tons of stuff, just not, not of Christ. Now, there's one that I see that's an antithesis of, of uh, the Christian intention, and that is this: I'm, I, I'm, I'm forgiven, but I'm not perfect. I go ahead and sin. The blood of Jesus. Christians aren't perfect; they were just forgiven, and that is totally wrong to this statement. Paul said this: to many of us have been given. Perfect, right? No, let us go on to perfection. We'll read about that in a minute, but Paul said that. Let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to mature. He didn't say let us go on to sinning. Now, the recent year or so, it's pretty serious about this, pressed into it. The Holy Spirit's pressing me hard about doing these teachings about foundations. And the Lord is calling for a higher level of righteousness right now. He is. Now, winking at the law thinks it's over. And I can say to you very simply this. When John is dealing with the whole matter of sin, Paul was, and John, if we sin, John said that. If, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If we sin. If. 
if, if, if sin is the exception to the rule, and you've all read it, if that's supposed to be the rule, uh, okay, let's deal with baptism. Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles and elementary principles of Dr. Christ, uh, the elementary instructions about Christ, of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Ooh. Or, and another good translation says this, let us continually progress towards maturity. Let's, let's keep heading there. Because once you stop, you don't just stop, you fall down. Let's not continually again relay the foundation, relaying it over and over again of, uh, well, here's the foundation, so those of you who are listening to it, check out your own foundations. We talk about this. And that's me, too. I'm not speaking down to you. I'm talking to you. This is a divine list. It's not my list. It's God's list. Repentance from dead works. Hmm. Repentance from dead works. And I've talked about this before. we got to talk about this. Faith towards God. Another one. Faith towards God, all the time. The doctrine of baptisms, and the laying on of hands, of uh, resurrection life, and what that entails in it, and the eternal judgment, or probably better said this way, divine government. Now, these are foundation stones that need to be laid down for each one of us so we can build on that. Now, verse 3 says this, least, and this we will do if God permits. Now, what are we going to do if God permits? We'll go on to maturity and to perfection. We'll just go on. Now, surely God wants us to go on, you say? You mean to tell me that God doesn't want me to go on? Yes, he wants you to go on. Yeah. But you get a, you got to have a building permit to go on. I've built buildings and done mechanical work and air conditioning work and heating work all over this land you have to have a permit now there's a while back and there's there's a question when i've been i've had many meetings in many churches and at a church i once wondered how many of the people in my church had a foundation of solid and uh it's they come to me from the lord about their foundations and I would say, I, I, I don't know. They seem to be nice people. And he wants to know about their foundations. And uh, I talked to the Lord. I said, I, I don't know. It kind of frightens me if I have my foundation made right. This is years ago. So I know if if I went to our little church and told them that, which I don't do right now. I don't have it. I'm not pressed it anymore. What, what, what are they going to say? The repentance, faith. God, new life in Christ, and talking to them, laying up hands to the Holy Spirit. Huh. The government of God. Well, that's something I had to think about when the Holy Spirit speaks to you about that. Yeah. I've had so many outpourings of God's Spirit. It was so exciting to me. It's for, it's for 30 years straight, you see, the anointing people would say, How is it? This church is so anointed. I never did trust myself, and I went by the doctrines and foundations that God laid me and started dealing with people. But I noticed that certain people wouldn't get past those things, and, and we'd have a lot of people come into the ministry. And we'll talk to these, I talk to people about the foundations and laying those things. And I would watch the outpouring of God's Spirit, how many repented and put their trust in Christ. And they, honestly, I went to baptize a few people and we weren't going to get baptized. They wouldn't repent. They're living in sin. They don't care about certain doctrines at all. They're philosophical doctrines. Uh, they blended a whole bunch of stuff with it. And these were older Christians and I talked to them about the basic things that Christ said to do. Now, we always had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit there at most of the time, unless somebody came there 
that they didn't repent before they came into the meeting. They didn't understand the foundations that were laid there. And, and God would not move. And I told him, "What? you're not moving. Why aren't you moving? And he would explain to me that these people, he didn't like what they taught and what they believed. They were all the Christians. And when I taught those things and moved in those things, the power of God would flow, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the utterance of tongues, people got healed. When the foundation was laid for them to follow through and go on to maturity, and over a period of 20 to 30 years, I had many different people, many different little services in the church. But most of it was not built on just fire that came from the baptism of the Holy Spirit and me staying on my face before God quite often. For people. Interceding for people. And not just myself too. And, uh, Lord, I can't do anything without you. And I would tell him, I can't do anything without you anointing me. I'm just mic taker, blah, 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 blah. We need your spirit. We need your power. We need the teaching proper. One of the first ones was baptism. And when these things got put in line, these foundations were put in line, it was wonderful. I, uh, I was ministering to a, a man and his daughter. And his wife was a rough way to go. She was a rough way to go. She would not give her life to Christ. She did die eventually. And she had AIDS and two or three other diseases. That she, her age, my God. The people that she hung around with, she, she did uh, some pretty bad things. Cute little thing, but she just did bad things. And I see her about every four or five months. Talk to her about the things of God. Her husband came to me and the little daughter and said, I'm getting divorced because I just can't stand to be around her. She's just too vulgar, too mean, too harsh. And I said, would you like to receive Christ now? Because you've been taught enough about it. And he said, I would. My daughter and I both would. She was about seven. And I said, okay. He came to my house. And we received Christ and he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. His daughter received Christ. And she didn't have another son at that point, but she believed it. She wanted to be. She, she wanted Jesus bad, and I said, "Okay, let's get baptized now." And they said, "Yes, let's." So, so we went out into the swimming pool with just our clothes on, a shirt, and everything there. We dove in and got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. They come up out of the water fresh, new and new and new. And he did divorce his wife, and she wouldn't come to Christ, and she did die early. She took on that spirit and she said that's just the way it goes. She would do good works behind the scenes. But it didn't get her into heaven. You're supposed to repent from repent from good works. <laughs> your, your works aren't going to get you any, any kudos with Jesus. If you are in Christ, it might. But it didn't before. It's not you're not going to work your way to Jesus, that's for sure. There's nothing stronger than the blood of Jesus Christ. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the baptism in water. The laying out of hands, these foundational truths. I've seen them over and over again when they started following the truth of what the Word said to do. Because they started going towards maturity and the Holy Spirit released those things that were part of their inheritance as they learned and as they went. If they didn't. I saw that many would come to a point of destruction or stay in that area quite often where there was no fruit coming into their life and mostly destruction. Everything bad seemed to happen to them, and they always wondered why. It's because they didn't stop sinning, but they thought the blood of Jesus would take care of that. We had no problem with that. Some were baptized, and that was even worse, because they, they continued on sinning even after that baptism in a public demonstration. And there's things that go on behind the scenes that you don't know about. There's things in the spirit world that you, that you have no idea. You think you're just getting dunked in water, and maybe it's an outward demonstration of what happened to you inwardly. Well, it is, but there's also many other things that things see, angels see, bookkeepers see. Your name's written down here for this and this and this. There's nothing you don't do that's not a record kept. Nothing. Baptism is so important. The baptism. Very important. Now, 
I have seen when they did follow these doctrines, proper doctrines, start doing what they're supposed to do, then the operate we go what's going on with what we're supposed to do. John the Baptist was baptized in, in water. There were thousands of thousands of people came out to the Jordan to to see John. The Pharisees said she was so disturbed about it they come out there and yak at him. Now John wasn't like Jesus. Jesus was a, a kind of an amiable, uh, outgoing sort of person. And John was severe. He was a roughie. Later on, Jesus said to, to John, you can't win. And John was kind of ascetic. He criticized John. I come among you and eat and drink normally. And you say, I'm a drunk and a wine bibber. You can't win. No matter what. You can't win. John used to come into a mysteriously out of the wilderness set up camp there by the Jordan, he had a strange piece of clothing on, camel's hair and, and a leather belt around his waist, made by his own hands probably, lived on oaks and wild honey, that type of judgment, taking good of the bad, which one are you going to have? Everything was a type of, John, he didn't know where he lived, come out of the cave in the wilderness, showed up, he'd come down to the Jordan and call everybody to repentance, the power of God would show up and send people there, the kingdom of God is at hand, you better repent. And he invites them to come down the water to make ready for the coming of the king, the Messiah coming. And he baptizes them. Hundreds of thousands of people out in the water. Got Jerusalem stirred up. Everybody knew about it. Now, I've said that to show you this. Number one, you say, why do I need to be baptized? And the first simple answer is this, because God said so. We're going to start there. I don't see any... I don't... I don't see being put down in water do anything to you. Now, we said that. That's not for you to decide that. It's not for you to decide any of that. If God said that you're to be rent and repent and stand on the corner and whistle, you better go do it. Wear banana skins around your neck and get saved. Now, that's what you're supposed to do. That's number one. Now, it's not quite that simple. Water baptism is, is a tableau, really. It's a, a work out picture of some tremendous redemptive act is what that is like it always was and paul says when you go down in the water and you're immersed you're baptized into christ's death that's what it said it's not talking that's immersion when you come out of the water it's called emerge immersion 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 you come out as a demonstration of christ coming out of the grave that's what it's supposed to represent, and more. And when you're baptized, you're saying this. I'm identifying myself, among other things, I'm identifying myself with Christ in his death and when he's cut off from the land of the living. I, too, in my baptism, am declaring that I am cut off from my former life. I'm cut off from my former life context of living, whatever that might be that was bad, I'm cut off from a world that's antagonistic, a world that a curl a world that I'm cut off I'm not through with it. The world is a doomed damn city. It's, it's dying. It's gonna die. You can't it's not gonna be saved. The world is gonna be waiting for judgment. It's been judged already. Jesus said this now is the judgment of this world. It's judged. Done. Jesus Christ and his cross put the, the curse on the world and its system. That's it. That done. Now, when you're baptized, you can't die on a cross, can you? You could, but you don't. God makes it easy for you. He does. That's what he did. You can't die as he did. You're not going to. He didn't ask you to. So you go down into a symbolic Water, baptism, and the death, his death. And as you go down into it, your declaration is saying goodbye to everything in the past. It's wrong and ungodly, everything that was. You're saying goodbye to it. It's over. All the things you did, all the stimuli that made you do all that, all the wrong things, possibly, all the situations that were yours before of destruction. They're dead now. You're saying goodbye. 
Now, as you come up out of the water, you're baptized into a whole new community of life and people. You became a part of the people. It should be holy people, godly people. Godly people who are forming a whole new life structure. Now, uh, it's a mouthpiece work, not full of good things to say. And uh, I've been to wonderful baptism parties, and I've seen some rough boys and girls get baptized and come out brand new. Some of them held under the water for a long time until the Holy Spirit saved and changed their lives. And they come up just praising God. You know, everybody around them going, oh, yeah, you can see that this is real. And it's wonderful. Amen. And a lot of them will say this, do you tell me God to forgive me of this? Forgive me of everything so I get born again and baptized? Yeah, he will take care of it. You've got to be bold about it. The Holy Spirit's going to do it. And there are many people that get baptized and just come on in. And I said before, like in the last couple of Bible studies that I've done, talked about intercession to get them there. And get them in and get them through, started off towards progressively towards the maturing of their bodies and maturing of the body of Christ. They can be an active part of the body, a proper part of the body, to repent and to act normal and proper. Now, Jesus didn't baptize, but his disciples did. And the first Christian meeting after the Holy Spirit had come and after the day of Pentecost, and the people saw the phenomenon. God was there. They knew that. They heard Peter preach. And the first gospel sermon, Peter was preaching. And it was the first time in history that Christian baptism was going to be ministered right there. And I jump around, but it's what happened. When Peter threw preaching, people began to cry out. And he's finished talking. Men and brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do? They said, help us. Peter said this, repent. Every one of you, repent, repent, foundations. You don't hear much on repentance much anymore. Yeah. Repentance is the negative side of faith. Uh, I believe in Jesus here. Yeah. What do you believe about your sin? Well, I have a few little sins. I'm sure Jesus won't mind about those. That's wrong. That's not what it said. You didn't hear, apparently. You didn't didn't hear it correctly. The other side of believing in Jesus is repent. Now, if I may put it kind of crudely to you, believing in Jesus is no longer believing, it's just sinning. They go, oh, no, no, no. Believing in sinning is what you just said. You, repentance is best described as this as Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Now, when he gets to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, when he's a good preacher, he gives an illustration. He loved to give Jesus gifts. You know, and a lot of preachers have good illustrations. Jesus had the best illustrations. Mr. Moody said illustrations are windows to let the light in so you can see what's going on. Now, Jesus used illustrations all the time, but he called them parables. Now, if a certain sower went, went, to, went, went forth to sow, a man's going to build a tower. This town figures out if he's got enough money to do it. He's supposed to figure out things out. Illustrations, parables. Well, men and brethren, they say, what should we do? Peter said, repent. And Jesus said, uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he said this. Simple story. Uh, and I wish I could tell stories as simple as Jesus did. He was good and simple with things, but he was a cracker. There's two men who came to me in my meeting, basically. They went to church, to his meeting. And... Both of these men heard my words. They did. They heard them. Now remember, both came to him. Both heard his words. But he said this. Both of these men went away to build their, their house, to build their life. Analogies. Building houses. God loves building analogies. God's a builder. And he loves to build. He loves those analogies. 
And those two men came to me, he said. Did, did you become Jesus? Yeah, I became Jesus. Yeah. Good. And we went and heard him. Did you hear his words? Yeah, I heard. I heard it. I can tell you all about it. Now, the next question is, what did you do about it? These two men went away, having been there, having heard, and they decided they'd build their lives now. Build, that's to build the house, their lives. Now, what Jesus said is what they're going to build it on, what he said. So they both built a house, only they built it differently. One man says this, the Bible says this, and I'm using the literal words of the King James Version of the Bible. He digged down deep until he hit the bedrock. That's right. And what did he do? He removed every obstacle, all the dirt, and everything between him and the rock. What he was going to build. If he hit the rock, he left the, wick, let the wicked forsake his ways. Now that's the negative side of believing. Let the wicked leave his ways behind. Get rid of them. There is no believing without repentance. You have to repent to believe. Believing is like building a house on the sand. That's what the other man did without repentance. So if you don't repent, you build your house on that sand. And the other man said, I don't have to dig down that. I'm not going to. That's, that's, that's cost me a lot of money and time and stress and effort. I just put, put my house up here, right up there, just throw some rocks up and lay it on there. He's not going to dig down. The other fellow's going down and he's going up. The guy that's going up seems like he's got his act together. He's got some sense, right? he got a house ready to live in. The other fellow don't. He's already lived in the house when the other guy's just barely finished his expedition his basement done. Wow. Big rock. Got that out of the way. He removed all the dirt between him and the rock. Him, him and Jesus. Got all of it out of the way. Now he starts to build. And he builds a house. Now, if you were to walk by on a summer's day and look at both houses, you know, they, they look alike. Sure, they look alike. They were built from the same plans and the same materials and built by the same architect. But one of them built it right and the other one built it wrong. The other one built it wrong. One of the missed part of the plans. He missed digging the foundation. He missed repentance. He wouldn't do it. Now, I want to go back to think of this. Um, uh, when I counsel people, I used to, I, can't, I stopped counsel a lot of them, but I counsel them out of books that I read and pastoral psychology and everything I learned. And I saw Hebrews chapter 6, and they come to me and I talk to them. John, tell me about your conversion, I say. Tell me about it. Tell me what you did and how about it. Now, invariably, I'd find the problem was is right in the conversion. Number one, they hadn't repented. They didn't repent from a dead work, their life, whatever it was. Or they weren't baptized. Or they'd never been filled with the Holy Spirit. Or they didn't understand resurrection life, and they certainly didn't understand moral government at all. So I didn't deal with the problems really. I stopped dealing with it. People thought it was funny. But no, I talk to them like I'm talking to you right now and give them my little sermon on foundations and say, we got to get these foundations right first. You're a Christian in trouble. It's what you are. And it was a lot of them. I said, well, this is what I found. In family counseling and counseling, they just didn't do it. They wanted to be way along in the Christian walk, and they couldn't do it. And you too, listen to me. You want to be further along, and you can't make it. Some, somewhere down it just falls apart. Let's talk about the foundation. Now, I'm going to talk about your problem, but you won't talk about your problem. But I don't want to talk about your problem. I want to talk about the foundation. This is the, the starting point. And I tell them, you need to get your foundation done. And when they get their foundation straightened out, they don't have a problem anymore. Uh, a lot of them didn't. They just walked off but because I didn't give them what they wanted. It was an instant fix, and there wasn't no instant fix. How many hear me? You hear what I'm saying to you? Now, the Bible, Jesus simply said this, and the storm came. What's that mean? What storm? It's the storm. Whatever storm. It's the storm. The storm. It's, it's the storm. Is whatever that may be. Now, you talk as if that storm's going to be there. It's inevitable. 
And I'm telling you right now, it's going to happen. Anybody here who listen to me in this tape say, if you miss the storm, oh, that's easier than saying, <laughs> it's, it's far easier said that than in it. How many have been in it? The storm. Who sent the storm? Well, everybody says the devil sent it. No, he didn't. No, he did not. God's blowing. The Lord's blowing. I rebuke you, Satan. I hear that continuously. You have to find out who this is God. It's not Satan. You hear this inside. Lord, is that you? Why are you blowing on my house? I want to see how you built. I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow it down. If you didn't build it right. I'd rather blow it down now and start building again than leave it up. Kill somebody. The storm came. Now, the storm is always going to come. It's going to be here. Take my word for it. I don't know what it's going to be, but you're going to do it. Uh, you, you can live through the storms of sin. You can do that. The, whipping, the, the wicked are like the waves of the sea toss. You can live in a perpetual storm. You just do it. But I take God's intermittent storms for me. Now, God's storms are designed to make me better and stronger, not designed to blow it away and kill me. But the storm came. It came from God. It didn't come from the devil. And the two houses were tested. One went down and the other stayed up. Now, that's the end of that. That's the end of the story. Up and down. One got blown down and one stayed up. And the Bible, I always, I hope it's not wicked, but I always have a secret thought. God, did you let that feller build again? Did you give him another chance to build again? I think that maybe could be seen in Bible context. Yeah, most likely. But a man who's stupid enough to, to not repent and is given another chance. Yeah, they are. I wouldn't build on it, but I mean, you're talking about a lifetime, quite a, well, a few years, never repented. Now, some of us older Christians listen to me. We uh, sing these beautiful hymns. I don't even know how it's written, half of them. There's a man by the name of H.G. Stafford. He was a very successful banker. And H.G. Stafford had a wife and two beautiful daughters. He wanted to bless them, so he gave them a trip to Europe on one of the great ocean liners. A lot of parables. We'll talk about this. Now, one of the ocean liners was see a horrendous storm came up. And he got this simple cablegram from, from the man. Saved alone, signed by his wife. He knew his two daughters had perished. They lost the sea. Now, Stafford was a godly man. He loved God deeply. He did. And while he grieved, he went and sat in his office and he began to write these things. When peace like a river attendeth my way, and sorrows like sea billows rose, whatever my lot, Thou uh, hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well. With my soul. The storm came. We found Stafford's personal house in, in chaos and wanton. And he didn't dig down deep. He dug deep for that one. He got, he had it. Modern baptism is one of these several of these plain foundations. It's the initial one, though. And I'm not going to take time this morning because I have other teachings on the line here. I have an entire study manual in book form about these foundations. I have pages on baptism. And I'm not going to give it all to you. It's a big subject, a vast subject. But I want to say to you this. Every person who comes to Christ is obliged to come to Christ's way. We've talked about this before. Christ's way is repent. That's turn away from, from your sin. Turn your mind about sin. It's a mental word. It's, it's a Greek word, metanoia. And it means this, to change your mind. Change your mind. Metanoia. There's two types of repentance, but you you know you, the one is to change your mind, 
or you got caught, repent, and you got caught, and you're sorry for it. No, this has changed your mind. You changed your life. People aren't donkeys. You're not donkeys listening to this. Neither am I. And sometimes we don't understand Christians. And this is it. This is what I've learned. Sinners are insane. We see sinners carrying on, and you wonder, especially nowadays, how can these people do all this stuff? They're nuts. They're, they're nuts. My wife and I were talking about that the other day. They're nuts. These people are just crazy nuts. And the ones that are affecting our society, they're really affecting people. They're nuts. There's not a nicer way of saying that. Mentally ill. <laughs> we're talking about a boy who wanted to jump his gun on his inheritance. Think about this. He went to his father and said, I want my share of the inheritance ahead of time because I don't want to stick around my own place here and get it all done. His father said, well, here it is. You take your money and go and get out. He stuck the roll in his pocket and headed out to the far country. And he spent it all in the far country. He he did it all, gone, on riotous living. You think what that was. And at last, he had to get a job. So he went to a pig farm, pretty big outfit. And imagine a Jew going to a pig farmer. He's got to be desperate to go to a pig farmer. <laughs> and he has a pig farmer for a job. And the pig farmer says, yeah, you can go out and tend my pigs. Stop them. And here's this nice little Jewish boy sitting out there in the pigs. He spent all his money out tending pigs now. And he's hungry. He's eating pig slop. And I guess that's the best he could do right there is eat that pig slop. And are you saying, Mike, that people who don't stay in their father's home are stupid enough to go eat pig slop? Yep. That's what most of the world's eating, pig slop. That's what they're doing. Look around. That's what they are. I don't even care if they're wealthy and rich. They're still eating pig slop. Now, which is what the Bible says. When he came to his senses or came to himself when he came to himself where's he been he's been gone and when he came to himself he said you idiot he's talking to himself you're an idiot here you are sinning eating this pig slot sitting here taking care of the stinking pigs and you're a good jewish boy and here you are feeding pigs think about it think about what you're doing sit and think Sensibly, he thought. Christians are the only people who think sensibly. Now, I don't have to prove that to you and get a real argument in some quarters about it, but they are. Overall, yeah, generally. They're thinking ultimate reality and the revelation of God. Sinners don't have that. They're just nuts. And they said, he said, when I think about it, my hired servants had to do a lot better than me. Just the hired folks. I'll, I'm going to go back to my dad's house and, and uh, kick that stool over and the pig pen and took off. And he stunk. You know, if you've ever smelled, you deal with pigs, they stink. He stink. He said, I'm going home. So when he got home, he was sane. He made reconciliation with his father. His father said, okay, my boy's back. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And put a robe on him. And killed the fatted calf and he called all his friends together and said, Come and make merry with me. My son was, he was dead. Gone, he was dead. He wasn't crazy, he was dead. There's another metaphor for you. He's returned. Now, I'm not just ministering for candidates for baptism. There may be a few out there. But I want you to know that we sometimes forget what it means, baptism. Sometimes we all forget what it means. When I was baptized in water, it was at a personal thing for me. I was baptized at Ken's Lake in Moab, Utah, in front of all my drinking buddies out there. And they were, that day, that day, they decided to all go fishing and playing and drinking beer and saw me and my wife baptized in that lake. The man that baptized was from Missouri. He was an old gentleman who had a lot to do with a lot of things right then. And said, who are those people? They all looked at a couple of them, clapped, and that was it. And it was something was washed away that I knew that all those friends are not my friends anymore. And as I waded through the water and started leaving, 
I knew that I was leaving something behind. My wife and I both did. We were leaving this behind. It was so obvious. It was distinct what the Lord did. Very distinct. Whoa. I was impressed with it. I had cut the ties with those people, cut the ties with the past. Baptism is not only a departure from, it's your entrance to as well. I was entering into a new life now. And I stuck with it. I not only coming out with what I were, but now I was emerging into what I was going to be forever. I come out of lostness into foundness. That's what it was. I was come out of judgment into no condemnation now. Now, your baptism is your way of saying, I, Mike Baker, do hereby declare in this act of baptism that I want to be done with my sin, done with that world. And I want to dig down and remove all the dirt between me and Jesus, everything. I want to forsake this wickedness and this mess, and I want to walk in righteousness. And it may take a while to learn that, but I will. I want to be saved from my sin. I don't want to be saved from hell. I want to be saved from sin and be tired of sin and just want to be free from that. How, are we, how many of you ever found that sinning, sinning added to your moral and physical well-being? Sinning does. Sinning, nearly, sinning will kill me or kill you. Sinning has nearly killed me few times. I mean it. It has. It nearly killed me. Sinning. Alcohol is killing thousands of people. Drugs killing people. Lots of them. Just that'll kill you. Dead. Promiscuity has brought the scourge of AIDS upon us and several other diseases. Until Lurking in our American society with so many STDs and diseases. We have a judgmental things hanging over us all the time. And people don't want to say that. They don't want to hear that. It, it just is. He said, it's the wrath of God. And I'll say it is the wrath of God. After this time, you see, it's, it's a whole bunch of it. You can't go anywhere without getting pumped that he has STD, sexual sin. It's the unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth and unrighteousness. For men, men and women involved in homosexuality and, and just so it's a perversion. And, and I'm not just picking on homosexual, but that's what the Bible said. But I'll you know, talk about murders. I can talk about other sins. I'm talking about homosexual sin. I'm not picking them out. I'm just happy to say this. The Bible very specifically says that men and women who engage in unnatural sex relationships with each other, that those people are going to, the Bible said this, reap in their bodies the results of what they're doing. That's what it said. I didn't say that. It said that. It's kind of a warning label. And suddenly we have AIDS across the earth in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. And it went across the earth. It is across the earth. And the homosexual were, were uh, bad at blaming them for it. And they're kind of, they, they got, I remember when they went through this, they were suddenly happy that heterosexual were getting AIDS. I had many people in my prayer meetings, Bible studies, and churches that had AIDS. And I had to tell them what to do, what not to do. And it was very important that they followed the rules and laws of things about repentance that went along with baptism, as Paul said so. I don't, I don't believe in reincarnation. I don't believe in the cycle of life like these things. And uh, I sometimes wish I could come back and redo certain things, have another go at things. I'm not. I have to accept it the way it is. I would. I can't change anything because I'm with Angela now. We have babies together. Just love each other. I wish I'd hold a tighter rein on myself. And I had to many times put a high rein on myself. I put a high high priority on righteousness. I do. Not in a legalistic, judgmental sense, just more in a pure sense. 
But it's hard to be around this world and into the midst of depth without this dirt getting on you, having to clean it off. Baptism is one of the foundations, one of the stones you need to have in your life, but repentance goes right along with that baptism. And once you're baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that. And I think over the past 40 years, I think there are many churches and Bible studies, and, and these Bible studies were very important, that I would have cultivated more of a foundation of righteousness and holiness to get rid of the sin in people's lives because they'd only go so far and then they would stop. And and Jesus would only go so far. There are many times I wanted to teach certain other things and the Lord said, no, they're going to teach this again and again and again and again because people were not doing it. They wouldn't do it. There were many times that the Lord would tell me certain things about their lives. This had to stop. And I would go to them privately and tell them, you have to stop doing these sins. You, you must stop doing this. Why? Because it's, it's going to affect your family and you. you. You got baptized, you professed Christ, and now you won't do what he wants. Very dangerous. Baptism. I don't think I taught it real great, but it's, it, this, it's baptism. Repentance for sin. Just repent. Be baptized and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter preached. And that's what we say. It's very simple, but very few people take it as gospel. You need to do this because Jesus told you to do this. Well, I've enjoyed this. This is Mike saying, Jesus is Lord. And those that are you listening to me, Father, bless them and help them in Jesus' name to go further with this. And if you haven't been baptized, go get baptized. Do what you're told to do in the Word. There's things you don't see, things you don't know. I think 95% of a life is you don't see it. You live in a spirit world, a world of spirits. They're here. They affect everything, but you don't think so. You're a spirit. You live in a body. I've never seen you. I might have seen your body, but I've never seen you yet. The real you inside, I don't see. I never will see until that day. We're all in Christ Jesus in heaven without a body. You have a spirit to be able to see you then. Father, bless him in Jesus' name. This is Mike. Jesus is Lord. 